Today we are at the Oregon State Hospital Museum of Mental Health, which is located in the, on the campus of the Oregon State Hospital, built in 1883. The museum is to show people the history of, of the treatment of mentally, the mentally ill and also uh, the progress that we've made and the progress that we still need to make. The room we're in now is called the Why Am I Here room, and it tells the different kinds of diagnosis that people would have received uh, to admit them to the state hospital. And some of them uh, are, um, well, pretty unusual. People who had venereal diseases, syphilis, people who had epilepsy, meningitis, uh, people who had uh, alcoholism disease were all admitted to this hospital at one time. I think this institution was a place where people were sent when they had some kind of an ailment that wasn't considered a standard gallbladder, tonsillectomy type of issue, and when they really didn't have a good way to uh, heal it. This dear lady came over from England and came to Missouri in the early 1800s and then came across on the covered wagon and she was admitted because she had melancholy and she also had neuralgia and she spent the rest of her life in this institution. The original state hospital was built on this site, was considered out in the country in 1883, in fact it was about three miles from downtown Salem and its site was chosen because it, it is a little bit elevated and it has a beautiful, beautiful scenery around it. Dr. Thomas Kirkbride was a physician in Pennsylvania in the early 1800s, but he also had a very keen interest in the buildings. He felt that the buildings were a part of the healing process for the mentally ill, and that those buildings should be something that uh, were very visible and, and very attractive. This would have been the typical size of a private room uh, in this old uh, uh, Kirkbride building. It's, it's an individual room with one bed and it's about 10 by 10. And the one distinctive thing about this room is the window. Because again, talking about Dr. Kirkbride's, Kirkbride's philosophy that we have a window that looks out on, on a beautiful scene. In this original Kirkbride building, the patients would have had their own room. As they added buildings onto this, uh, they uh, created double rooms and in some cases ward rooms that would have been, of course, much larger. After Dr. Kirkbride's philosophy, folks uh, began to look at uh, more of a medical uh, intervention and so we move into things like uh, hydrotherapy. Hydrotherapy is just like we do now. It's a wonderful spa. It's a, it's a relaxing the warm waters that were controlled by this big instrument here that calmed patients down and, and uh, made them feel, feel quiet. Uh, there also was um, uh, insulin therapy, insulin shock therapy, which they no longer use, but it certainly in, in, induced a, a, a seizure that would supposedly calm the patients down. The table behind us would have been used for uh, probably lobotomies, and they were done on this campus, but they were stopped in 1968. They took uh, the, the frontal lobe was um, destroyed by an, an instrument that looked like an ice pick that was inserted through the occipital lobe of your eye, and literally it was destroyed. So most people who that had to have that done were extremely agitated and uncontrollable and, and pretty much it left them um, not in a vegetative state necessarily but in a very, very different person than they were before, very calm. The movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which by the way won five Academy Awards, was shot here in 1975. In the cuckoo's nest they did use electric shock treatments and uh, again that's still used today but in a, in a, a modified form. And it was, it was a controversial movie, it's a controversial book, and the uh, plan to have it shot here on campus was also extremely controversial. There were some in the legislature and some staff do uh, doctors that felt that was not a good idea. Dr. Brooks, who was superintendent then, uh, had a different idea. He felt that it would be uh, something that would boost 
the image of mentally ill, and also he knew that the story itself was an allegory. It wasn't, it wasn't true, but it did show an abuse of power. Dr. Brooks was also in the movie. He played the superintendent in the film. He also acquired two things. One, that they do not dehumanize the patients in any way or make it uh, uh, uncomfortable for them. And two, that patients would be hired to be in the film. And indeed they were. I think the movie was definitely a Hollywood version, but it also shows that uh, abuse of power can get out of hand and it can be misused. There is always abuse of power. There's going to be no matter what institution you're in. But if you make this more um, accessible, I believe that that eliminates some of that abuse of power. Patients originally at the state hospital, uh, when they passed away, they were, they were buried. They were running out of space, so they exhumed those bodies and, and cremated them. And so they put, made little copper canisters, and the cremains were put in those canisters. They buried them on the campus in a drained pond in, in separate vaults, and uh, they were there for many years. When somebody went to claim someone, they found out that the canisters indeed, because they were copper, they were beginning to corrode. And they were beginning to corrode in very colorful manner uh, and very individual manners. The story of the canisters is, is in a way a sad story because it means that a lot of people that lived and died here were not claimed by their relatives and were in essence forgotten. Uh, also the canisters, I think because of the different ways that they are um, corroding, show the individuality of people, that each one is different as we all are.